Thank you, Professor Batia. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so you already know from the previous presentation who Professor Mar Marsden was and how important role he played in the research, uh, diagnosis and treatment of dystonia. When Dystonia Europe was founded in uh, 1993, Professor Marsden uh, gave also Dystonia Europe founders a lot of uh, good advice and took a great interest in the developing of our organization. It was therefore appropriate that David Marsden should be honored by an award given by patients in his name. The world of neurology and especially dystonia patients are grateful to him. And we hope this award will inspire many more young scientists uh, to do dystonia research. We also want to thank Ibsen for their great support of this award. It is a honor for me to present the 10th David Marsden Award to Dr. Martin Reich from Julius Maximilians University, Department of Neurology in Würzburg, Germany, for his paper, Probabilistic Mapping of the Antidystonic Effect of Pallidal Neurostimulation, a Multicenter Imaging Study. Please join me here virtually, Dr. Reich, to receive the award and give the presentation on your research. And thank you in behalf of uh, Estonia Europe and Estonia community for your dedicated work on Estonia and much good luck in the future. Hello everyone. Um... It's my pleasure to uh, speak to you today, and I'm really, really honored um, to be elected for this uh, um, um, tremendous David Marston Award. Um, and thank you so much uh, for the um, Distuna Europe um, uh, Foundation, uh, which uh, uh, um, gave me this prize for the just published um, article about probabilistic mapping of anti-dystonic effect of pallidal neurostimulation. And I renamed a little bit my talk today to um, the digital specialist uh, for DBS and how this uh, could look like in the future is um, pictured here. This could be um, uh, our digital specialist for deep brain stimulation, which um, will potentially support the doctors uh, on the ward um, in the near future. But um, let's spend uh, the first um, minutes uh, talking about dystonia and the idea about dystonia. And you just heard the great talks of Kaish Batya and others. And um, I wanted um, uh, to, to highlight the idea of dystonia and how DBS um, is working here. And for this, I bring one of my patients with me. This is um, Jan, and this is in uh, 2013 when he was uh, first time admitted uh, to our hospital. And as you can see here in the video, uh, he's shivering from a clear um, generalized um, dystonia, um, uh, which um, give us many, many problems uh, uh, in walking, uh, going to the school, uh, sitting in the chair. Um, and as you may know already, um, dystonia is a um, typical network disorder. So this means there are um, different areas in the brain uh, which are usually communicating uh, to make it possible to move. Um, and in dystonia, this uh, motor network is somehow uh, disrupted um, by pathological uh, oscillation. And um, really crucial parts um, of um, this dystonia network are the primary motor cortex, the premotor cortex, but also sensory motor cortex and the cerebellum, and which in the end affects um, the muscles, which are hyperactive and um, um, bringing this uh, problem um, of twitching um, movement, involuntary movements, as you saw, for example, um, 
in Jan before. And the problem in, in this network disorder is not that one of this network partners, partners are not function anymore. The problem is the communication between each other. And you can imagine that similar to an orchestra uh, where you have um, different, different instruments um, um, to partner in the end uh, for a nice um, piece of music. And one, when one of the partners, um, all partners are not playing in the same rhythm, then um, ugly, mus uh, ugly music is the result. And therefore, um, you have the conductor, which take care that all the oscillations um, in this uh, concert um, are really nice um, harmonized and um, the music is nice. And similar, um, BBS is acting as well. It's tried to harmonize this pathological oscillations. And how effective this could be, you can see in um, the patient we saw before, Jan, uh, today. Today, um, he, he's a professional uh, person, in a, uh, a team member in a racing team. Um, and here you can see him giving us a tour uh, to one of this um, racing team garages. And he's explaining how all this is working and um, how many different tires uh, they bring for a race and so on. And as you can see here clearly, he's not anymore suffering from dystonia. And this is a part of his uh, team, and they won also the uh, 24 hours of the more um, race uh, a year ago. And he contributed uh, to this uh, team. He was not actually racing, but uh, he was an important part of it. And a part of his treatment um, was the DBS, and um, or the only part of his treatment is the DBS. And a really important part is the implantation of the DBS electrode. Um, and this is done by the neurosurgeon. This is a neurosurgeon, Robert Nickel, from my center here in Würzburg. Um, and he um, actually placed uh, this lead, and this is a visualization uh, of Jan's uh, implanted lead really nicely in the pallidum, which is the main target here for uh, dystonia control. And it's, it's a really, really fine surgery, uh, which you can see um, here nicely when this electrode is put it in. But this makes the possibility of um, electrical modulation um, of the brain. But it, this is only one part of the therapy, which is um, um, a highly precise part um, of the therapy, which um, it's really important to put it in, in a really best spot of the pallidum. Um, but the other really important part is the programming, uh, programming of the device. And probably some of you do have a DBS device and you know this exactly. There are many different options and you refine the treatment by the electrical stimulations. And usually this is the work of the neurologist. And then as you can see here in the computer model, you have different options uh, to stimulate. Hereby, the, the lowest option is most probably the best um, option to stimulate um, the, uh, the blue part here, which is um, the pallidum, whereby the, the highest contact, it's not anymore placed there. And how we refine this therapy, um, and this is by clinical testing. We looking in an acute setting um, and looking for each of these possible contexts, for the best stimulation results on the dystonia. And then um, we're looking for side effects to see where is the therapeutic window, the, um, the window we can um, play with our electrical stimulation. But there's a particular big problem in dystonia, and this is different to all other um, movement disorders. This is um, 
so, so and programming time so and this is sorry um <laughs> skip one slide and um, programming time there are many, many different options. With the old device, there was more than 12,000 options. And the newer device, the later device, have millions of different options of um, uh, because of hardware innovations. And this can create a little bit headache for the neurologist. And the other big, big problem, especially in dystonia, and this was what I uh, tried to point out already some seconds before, um, is that the electrical stimulation do not have a direct effect on your dystonia, which is really nice highlight here. Um, when you are switching on, um, you do have an effect which are building up over time and it's taking hours and up to months be before you see the full picture of dystonia control. And also highlighted here, when you are switching off the device, or changing the stimulation settings, you have carryover effect from the older settings, which makes the programming with looking to the patient in particular really, really complicated because you're changing the stimulation parameters and the results you will do see days or weeks after that. And this makes a much problem. And in our particular cases of Jan, um, how often we programmed him um, back in Würzburg. And it was 18 times um, he was presented in our outpatient clinics. And he was more than 40 days as an inpatient before we make sure that he can ski also in the Alps. So this means more than 80 hours we spend programming in this um, young boy. Um, and this is, it really, really a big problem in him. We found the right stimulation parameters, but um, because of this complexity of so many different options and um, the problem of this delayed uh, visible effects, there are a really current problem, which is highlighted here in the study of Jens Faltmann, and this is a, a clinical trial. And as you can see here, these are um, in um, black marked patients with no effect of the DBS. On the other hand, in green, these are really good responders. So there is all a big variability in this uh, cohort. On the one hand, good responders and bad responders. And now we come to my study, which was um, uh, awarded with the David Marston Award. And in this study, um, we looked in particular to this uh, problem. And, and I was able with a lot of friends um, from all Europe um, to get up to 90 patients operated um, on her dystonia. And as you can see here, also a great variability between these patients. On the one hand, the super respondent, which have in the end more or less no dystonia anymore. And on the other hand, up to 25%, which no effect on their dystonia. Um, and we were hypothesizing, this is linked to the implantation site. So the lead location inside the target area and the put it stimulation parameters. And we choose the imaging approach, took the preoperative brain scan of the patients, and merged them together with the postoperative brain scan of the patient. And with a computer model, we were able to visualize which individual brain area was stimulated for each patient. And then we linked that um, to the dystonia reduction, which was clinical observed in this patient in the long run, after three years or longer. And then we aggregated all this data and made a statistical map out. And this is a statistical map, as you can see here. And this statistical map, you can ask where's the spot which a neurosurgeon or a neurologist together should stimulate, which give us the highest likelihood to have a good stonia control, which we called sweet spot. Um, and this is actually here placed 
immediately uh, took with uh, um, a portion in the white matter of the polydon, which is the target region, uh, which was supposed to be the target region before. But then we asked how much um, can explain um, of our cohort variants. And you remember, on the one hand, we had really good um, doing patients with DBS. And on the other hand, there was a not favorable outcome with no effect of the DBS. And how much is this linked to this idea spot in the brain you should stimulate? And as you can see here, when we look to the active contact, so the um, electrode contact, the neural they just have chosen in each patient based on the surgical implanted um, lead, you can see we can't explain much here. And there's no clear pattern um, which is um, pinpointing to the sweet spot. And this was, of course, a little bit frustrating result, um, but we kept motivated uh, on that. And our will highlight our thoughts and the idea um, with a small tour. And uh, imagine your um, a small tour about sweet spots and the idea spot. And imagine you are booking holidays in Paris. And here, your hotel is placed here. And the sweet spot, the best spot in Paris, and when you ask many, many people or your best friend, he will may say, hi, it's an Eiffel Tower. Yeah. And when your hotel is there, reaching the Eiffel Tower can be a challenge. And possibly you need a taxi to drive there because it's quite far away. Yeah. But on the other hand, this is not how the, the, the young society now is working. And you know, Today is all digital and all is about posts and likes in the new generation. And a map from Paris may look not like that with only one highlight um, area or place. It's potentially looking more like that with a lot of places, the Louvre, the Sacré Coeur and all the others. And then when the new generation have been somewhere, they are posting likes because they have been there. And then they, you get recommendation from many, many, many persons, which is highlighted here with the Google stars, whereby five stars is highly recommended and one star, not so much. And as you can see here, yeah, Still, the Eiffel Tower is the best place in Paris by this uh, meaning of many, many people. But the Sacre Coeur, it's nearly there. And it's much easier to reach um, from your hotel. So possibly you go easier to the um, Sacre Coeur instead of the Eiffel Tower. And this is similar to the probabilistic map. Um, the entire statistical map. So we took that map and applied here the individual stimulation field of a patient and counted based on this probabilistic map um, the values which are reflecting the experience from all the other operated patients. And with that approach, we were able to explain here very precisely the variants of the cohort. And we were also able to predict patient outcome only on the stimulation fields. So meaning we took patient wound here and we showed our, uh, and we did our pipeline um, to find the stimulation field, which is clinical stimulation parameters. And we were able to forecast this patient, how good is he doing on the DBA therapy? And as you can see here in patient one, this was not favorable. He, but on the second patient here, 
the forecast was 90% and he was actually doing really, really well with 98%. And this is really nice if we can forecast by the choosing, the clinical choosing parameters, how the patient is doing. And this is so far so good, but mainly motivated by um, the reviews in brain, um, we thought maybe we can go a step farther. And the further step is we know at the moment the neurologist is um, checking all the different possibilities on the stimuli, uh, on the implanted leads, but why not the computer can doing that when he can predict one outcome, he can predict all the thousands of outcomes. And actually, this is what we did in a simulation. So this was only a simulation on a computer. If this is a possibility for the future. And here we checked all our patients on different stimulation settings, which was not the stimulation settings, um, which was before chosen by the neurologist. And then the computer and uh, checked all these possibilities and choose the best one, the best predicted setting. And as you can see here, the computer selected choice have a potentially um, significant improvement compared to the clinical program choice. So, and this is um, something like artificial intelligence um, approach to potentially program DBS devices in dystonia in the future, which raises a lot of hope here. And based on that, um, we were really motivated to test this um, in the hospital on real patients. And um, with the help um, of uh, um, nationwide funding in Germany, we will start um, to see the first patients um, in October this year for a randomized trial. So we will test exactly this computer-based approach on our statistical map from the publication in BRAIN compared to the clinical approach, which was um, used since 20 years in dystonia. And we'll see in a crossover design study here if possibly the computer advised stimulation parameters are equal or better for our patients. And um, yeah, really looking to the forward to this study. And for me, as a clinical scientist, for the next logical step after um, um, yeah, in, in a, a study like that, trying to translate that directly to US patients. And this is um, my team here back in Würzburg, uh, which is working uh, with me on this um, study and also um, on this upcoming clinical trial and my both mentors, Jens Volkmann and Michael Fox. And uh, many, many thank also to all the collaborators which uh, massively helped to put all the patient data together and make, um, yeah, hopefully also a successful clinical trial in the future. Now I'm really looking forward to your question and um, to discuss all these findings with you.